back to this session that's entitled Concepts of Women, Visions of Feminism. And it's an honor to present uh, our first panelist, uh, Professor Noel McAfee from Emory University, who will be presenting For Love of the World with Steva and Arendt's Liberatory But Not Quite Feminist with the Politics. Thank you. So I'm going to stand and sit. Um, so I, this, I thought that I wrote a beautiful abstract for this paper. I was going to write the paper a couple of weeks ago. And then I uh, went to have a meeting with somebody who was, uh, uh, helps run the Emory Psychoanalytic Institute. Talked about some things. He's a former editor of the journal, uh, the uh, American Psychoanalytic Association's or their journal. And when I met with him, he said, oh, yeah, there's a couple of really interesting things. He said, um, we were talking about the psychoanalytic training program. He said a lot of people are, who are used to be in neuroscience are now becoming attracted to psychoanalysis because they realize they can't really get what they want from just the sciences. They have to go and uh, be in psychoanalysis. And, uh, so there's a kind of rapprochement. He pointed me to uh, something probably nobody here really reads, Discover Magazine, the current issue. Has anybody seen it? Has Freud on the cover, The Return of Freud, through some people who did do neuroscience who realized that it doesn't really tell us anything really about the mind, so we bring it together. This is kind of rough push him up. And he also mentioned, he said, oh, and you should take a look at the most recent issue of the journal. It's on Christeva. Can I borrow a cup? So I did, and then that changed everything about what I was going to do today, because what is in here, um, some of you may have uh, read it or heard about it, is the uh, a translation of a piece that Christeva gave a couple years ago before mentioning a session yesterday. And the title is Maternal Eroticism or Re Reliance or Reliance. Anyone here familiar with this? Good. No one knows more than I do. Because <laughs> I know what I've figured out in the past 10 days reading this piece. Um, actually, uh, there are some people here who do. But, so I want to tell you about this. So, it, so the topic is still the same in terms of Christophe's feminism. And there's certainly a lot of overlap with Arendt quickly, you know, but it's really hoping that I would talk about that. You know, both both Kristeva and Arendt are kind of displaced cosmopolitans who think that don't really care too much about traditional feminism or maybe actively dislike it. They think that women's freedom is achieved through their singularity or becoming a who in Arendt's language by distinguishing themselves uh, and that focusing on the conditions that oppress women takes you down the wrong path into just need poverty and doesn't get you to singularity. So I'll talk a little bit about some of that. But, um, so in this piece, there, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this piece and also some of the essays in uh, Hatred and Forgiveness. And in both of those, she mentioned some things that reminded me of the Discover Magazine's discovery of uh, this gap between neuroscience and psychoanalysis and needing to come together. And one uh, thing she touches on, just Christeva touches on that kind of that she's really, um, and she says of the, the her helper, is that how you said helper prize acceptance? Um, I'm personally convinced that the future of psychoanalysis lies in this direction, that is, between the translinguistic logic of the unconscious and biological and neurobiological constraints. So this place in between. So I can say that this is one area of inquiry that's really alive for her. Is this kind of biopsychical arena? There's long been an impasse between those who thought, you know want to reduce everything to bodies and those who talk about meaning or brain and mind, uh, biology and psychology, matter and spirit, um, internal reality, external reality. So for her, there's a place of convergence. There might be a kind of permeability between those, and there's a kind of just like Heidegger has Dasein as the thing for which you can understand being. The place to which you can understand this convergence is the pregnant mother and the mother. That's the space in between. So that's what we'll talk about. So the um, she has says on this in the I'll call it the Joppa article. Could there be a permeability between biology and the psyche? What is the correlation between the intensity of that phantasmatic and hallucinatory functions and certain biological changes in the pregnant woman. So that, just to give you a little taste of it, I'm still just setting this up. Um, in, in, in looking at this intersection, Christeva draws on the writings of Lou Andreas Salome, who attributed to the maternal, precisely, the capacity to establish and overcome the pathological split 
capacity as between matter and spirit and all that. A capacity by which the maternal actualizes the connection between internal and external reality. This is, um, let's start again, matter and symbol, masculine and feminine. And, and uh, Andrea Salomon's words, restores the loss from which the process of individuation suffers. For Kristeva, the maternal function, the maternal eroticism or reliance, which I'll explain to you, is doubly important. First, for delivering the newborn into the social and symbolic world, and second, for emancipating women themselves. I have to say, when I read this, I was a bit shocked. So it reminds me of some of the uh, debates going on in the 80s and 90s you know, about whether the French feminists were essentialists, you know, because Christophe was talking about the maternal and all of this, seeming so essentialist. Um, I think these recent writings of Christophe show that the previous disputes, the disputes were not matters of misunderstanding, but were really fundamentally different ideas about women's freedom, about their bodies. So in my brief remarks here on this text on reliance, as well as a few others, I want to explore these differences further. So first, uh, talking about what is feminism for Christophe, you know, any kind of uh, definition of feminism might be something about women's freedom. I think it's the most minimal thing that pretty much anybody who calls herself a feminist in any way would attribute as women's freedom. So uh, in, uh, in the Hatred and Forgiveness essay, she talks about two kinds of freedom. One is the calculation or instrumental freedom. She doesn't say much more about it. It's the same kind of uh, worries that Heidegger had, so she's talking about most about calculation, thinking that, or Arendt has the same kind of worries about mere, cog mere um, cognition, but that's not really thinking. For Arendt, thinking is when we are actually uh, thinking without a banister or a truly free way, what Kant called the scandal of reason, that's Arendt's behind that. We want to think in a way that's really more open and inquiry. And Kristeva, of course, uh, is, applauds that and uses that language. So we have calculation on the one hand, and in contrast, the other kind of freedom is this thinking, uh, eternal questioning. So of Christopher's words here, the, of the, of the kind of questioning of the poet, the libertine. So we can get those notions of revolt uh, and trying to achieve singularity. So I contrast those in that way, those two kinds of freedom. She doesn't say more. I'm kind of curious if she would say that the sort of the two kinds of feminism, because she also has uh, makes these distinctions between the, the stages of feminism. So this is familiar from women's time, but she returns to it in these later essays, where she delineates three stages. First, the, the suffragettes, activism, or political rights. Stage one. Stage two, uh, Beauvoir's affirmation of equality and universality, that, that second wave feminism, all about that. And then this third stage, the search for sexual difference, appreciating um, well, well, the second one where women would say mostly reject any identity that was connected to being pregnant. You know, we don't want our biology to become destiny, or to be pregnant, that's what women are. So second wave, totally distancing from maternity. The third wave, returning to it, saying there's something about maternal experience. And women can decide whether or not to have children, that that's um, something to be appreciated. So Kristeva uh, was awarded the Holbrook Prize for all of her literary and theoretical achievements, and also listed in that uh, prize was for her work on feminist theory. So in her response, uh, uh, in the course of the speech, she does address how or not her work is feminist. Uh, one thing she points to is her interest in the work of feminist geniuses, such as Arendt, Klein, and Colette, and to add others. Her argument is that such women, and men could do it too, have distinguished themselves and have achieved a certain kind of liberty. I think it's that second form of liberty. That uh, she would like to place this experience, in her words, in the context of the various political, philosophical, and literary debates which have nourished women's and men's liberation in recent times. In other words, she continues, quote, I only accept the feminist label on the condition that my thinking on the themes of writing and feminine sexuality is seen within the framework of thinking about liberty and dark times. Her view about what makes times dark is linked up with her theory of liberty. This will not be the freedom within the logic of instrumentalization or calculation, 
um, but rather freedom as the very essence of philosophy, as eternal questioning, before allowing it to become fixed. So she says, it is a conception that is evident in the speech being, that she uses this Heidegger, Heideggerian language of presenting of the self to the other. That's the kind of freedom that women need. The, she says, the notion of individual feminine genius can take us beyond mass feminism, in which the uniqueness of each one risks being submerged, although clearly this sort of notion of genius can be extended to both sexes. Uh, Arendt makes the same kind of claim that, um, that we need to distinguish ourselves. That's what's really interesting, not just that we, what we all share. I, if I have time, I'll come back to this. This is my watch. Uh, that it's not that the, femi that the mass feminism has focused on the conditions that oppress women. Arendt and Kristeva are interested in the conditions that, that no matter how many conditions are like that, what's important is to distinguish ourselves and to rise above that. So that this genius. Beauvoir, she says in one of those essays, was um, onto this in that her existentialist ethics is about transcending oneself. Um, Beauvoir does two things in her ethics of ambiguity, both looking at how we transcend ourselves, but also looking at the terrible conditions that keep people from doing that. So Beauvoir's focus mostly went towards what are, to ridding ourselves of those conditions that oppress people. So Christeva's argument is that she should have focused more on the ways in which people become singular. So Beauvoir stopped short of freedom for each as a singular being. So that's a little background. I want to get into the um, this new piece. Um, so returning to the biopsychical convergence, the maternal convergence is of a very special sort. As I mentioned, the pregnant woman. It is an erotic relation of mother to child. And I should actually read to you the first paragraph of this. So this, this essay, this journal issue, has, there's a section here of uh, one woman, Rosemary Balsam, giving a little background on, for those who don't know Kristeva, what these basic concepts are. And there's Kristeva's essay, translated essay, and then a couple of commentaries on it. Um, so she starts off. To live and to think the maternal as erotic, wouldn't that be as provocative as to speak of infantile sexuality? One might think so in light of all the social crises that conceive of the maternal as just the fulfillment of all vital needs, while certain superficial interpretations of contemporary psychoanalysis suggest, quite wrongly, that psychoanalysis assigns sexuality exclusively to the lover and the unbearable destiny of object relations to the maternal. So psychoanalysis, you know, Colin Klein and all, thinks of the maternal as just the have this unbearable destiny uh, that the child fights against, or that the, the sexuality is the, the, the father's libido, the lover's libido. There's very little attention to the mother's eroticism, her mother's erotic relation to the child. And recall language in Stabat Mantra, where she's having very much a kind of erotic relation to this child. And that, if anything, has been seriously objected. We just don't want think about that. But this eroticism, which will have the primary affect of this maternal eroticism, is actually tenderness. And it does a lot of work in helping the, move the newborn into the, into the social, which connects with a lot of her earlier work, the maternal function. But here it's much more specific, and it's erotic. So she uses um, the term, uh, uh, is a kind of synonym for ma maternal eroticism of relegance or reliance, and so on. You can hear in that the religiosity of binding together. And there's a lot that goes on, and I'll go into some of this. But, um, okay, so. so she wants to say that there's something about this concept that she's developing that has great explanatory power that psychoanalysis has appointed to very much. The woman who becomes a mother is gripped by both biopsychic events, pregnancy, childbirth, nursing, but also by a passion and undergoing and a suffering that is also a vocation. She is a multiverse of maternal eroticism. So that her first pass of explaining this is probably one of the most difficult, is, is as difficult as any for difficult writing. So I'll, I'll just quote this passage and then we'll work on explaining it. 
So, reliance. I, I hypothesize that um, reliance is a specific economy of drives such that counter-confected by psychical representation and thus fixed by psychic inscriptions, the energy of the originary split at once sustains and moves through primary and secondary repression. I want, actually, I'm going to stop quoting because it's just incomprehensible. Right? You know, right now, what on earth? But it's by going through when she goes piece by piece that this actually begins to make sense. So, first of all, this does build on her concept of the semiotic, right? That at times she says it's not about, it's not feminine, it's about the feminine, but then it is about the semi. So the semiotic, beginning with the Korah, as a way of, a pre-linguistic way of, of, of expression. So as she says uh, in the Holbrook Prize lecture, the distinction that I've established between the semiotic and the symbolic has no political or feminist connotation. It is simply an attempt to think of meaning not only as structure, but also as process or trial. But she does link up the semiotic with this mother-child relation. She says, the semiotic transverbal aspect of our research is connected to the archaic relation between mother and child and allows me to investigate certain aspects of the feminine and the maternal in language, where Freud used to call, which, where Freud used to call the black continent or Minoan Messinian, this other logic of the feminine and the, and the maternal that works against normative representation and opposes phallic representation, both masculine and feminist, feminist, feminine, is perhaps my contribution to the endeavor to understand the feminine is connected to the political via the sacred. I just have to say that in that passage, which is very perplexing, she begins it by saying that my semiotic has no con connect conception, no connection to the political or feminist, but then she ends by saying it is connected to the political. So it's, she does seem to be of two minds about that, but in, in the in the recent piece on maternal eroticism, she actually goes deeper into exactly how this maternal and this alternate logic works. So, so let me go through some of these things. I don't want to go over, so how would you? Three more minutes. Three more minutes. Okay, quickly, some of the things about reliance. One is it is um, it's a kind of passion and vocation. So the mother undergoes, it's like a surprise, passion has two aspects here. First surprised by something, but then it becomes familiar. And the vocation is the kind of the, the old vocation of what it is to be a mother. That is one's a vocation that one enters into. Um, it is the, the, this maternal eroticism is, is at this place where the, uh, the very early uh, era for the newborn, before the resolution of the Oedipal complex where between where the, the newborn is at this gap between self and other, wanting basically to fall back into the mother's body and just pop, or going in moving into language, this kind of place where a, a, the thing, the, the what is seems so kind of other to meaning and signification. The maternal eroticism kind of gently helps move the infant into the symbolic, partly by the the disunity of kind of thanatos of disbinding. Uh, um, and also there's a mutual work of abjection from the mother objecting the newborn and the newborn objecting the mother and the mother objecting the thing. And so there's a, both a kind of a loving kindness of freeing the infant rather than the mother possessing the infant that would just kill it. So by freeing gently with this back and forth in this tender way of, of doing this, the mother helps to move the child into it. And uh, I'm So we haven't, because of the kind of abjection of this maternal eroticism, she says, we can, psychoanalysis hasn't really noticed the mother's, the structural role of the maternal eroticism in moving the child towards identification with the father, right? It's because of the ma maternal's connection to the father as well that the infant begins to do that as well. So this is just the, the, the mother's tenderness that is both a binding and unbinding that the next the child over. So, she finally then explains uh, reliance as both to link, to, to gather, to join, to put together, also to adhere, to belong, to depend on, and therefore to trust. So the, the infant begins able to, to trust, to share its own feelings, to assemble together, to be itself. So this maternal eroticism and reliance has this function. So I'm going to close with this question, and I don't know the answer. 
what is the connection between freedom as singularity, the freedom that I mentioned at the beginning, the freedom of the poet and the libertine, the freedom to become singular, and the and this maternal eroticism. She says things at the end of this essay that I just have to say. Uh, there will not be a free woman as long as we lack an ethics of the maternal. Uh, one of her commentators says that she is implanting the maternal at the heart of the ethical. That is actually necessary for women's freedom. Yeah, so the free woman is just being born, wrote Simone de Beauvoir. And Christina says, there will not be a free woman as long as we like an ethics of the maternal. So I, this is my question. It's my perplexity, really. What kind of, we have these two kinds of freedom. Uh, how are these, in any way, feminist? If at all? And if there's a connection? So we have 10 minutes for questions. of um, biological being or physical material being or <clears throat> in what ways do you see that this being related to the, the way that you preface the talk with the relationship to neurosciences and more uh, the kind of expansion into uh, the physical science. Yeah, she has one example. She talks about the diabetic pregnant woman. And that the, the diabetic pregnant woman uh, actually begins to change her own, that once she's pregnant, her biology begins to change. She, might she gravi gravitate to a better food, or if she continues to be ill, she might end up miscarrying the baby, the, the fetus. So there's, she was noticing some kind of connection between the biology of the pregnant woman and her mother. Yeah. I mean, just a little more following up, just because I mean, some of that also was tremendous responsibility. Um, I mean, so things about reproductive health for, for women and the ways in which a lot of um, uh, uh, medical conditions and health conditions for infants are blamed on the practices of the mother. And so in some ways that can be um, really detrimental to a kind of feminist project. But, um, but there's far too much investment in the, a certain, like that, that a, someone needs to eat a certain regimen that they're not meeting a very high bar in order to properly care for the child. So I wonder, I, I think she largely thinks that this uh, is a, happens to a woman. That it's, it's not that the diabetic woman decides she's going to eat better, but that somehow being pregnant will um, unconsciously really change her own biology. I could try to find a passage in there, but it is. I have to say, it's just really a lot of this is very troubling to me as a feminist. I find it very troubling. I then again at the same time I want to understand it. I, I don't want to reject it. So I have when I first started reading Kristeva, uh, uh, you know, as a graduate student, I, I was just gobbling it all up. And then as I've taught more feminist theory, more kind of mainstream feminist theory, and I'm on the board of the Stanford Encyclopedia section on feminist theory, was I'm the only continental person there on that group. And so all, all the mainstream feminist theory has good reason to go, what? The freedom, women's freedom is tied to they're deciding whether or not to be a mother. Um, she's not saying that we all have to become mothers, but it's in our relationship to whether or not we were going to become mothers, that that is formative for women. It's really important to have freedom, to, to stand in relationship to motherhood. But I agree with you that there is probably, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna line up behind the people who just dismiss her because of this, I, I'm still. I don't have an answer to your question either, but um, I, I have a mother, like everybody has a mother. But my mother was one of the kind of early leading feminists in Australia, and she also had six children and was pushed out of the feminist movement in Australia in the... She was pushed out? In the, in the late 60s, early 70s, because of that ideology that if you were a mother, basically you couldn't be a feminist. Um, but, so, you know, I've thought about this question all my life and it, it seems to me like what I actually find troubling is not 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 the idea that 
all women should be mothers or even think of themselves in terms of motherhood. But we live in something called patriarchy, and patriarchy is in some sense founded on the uh, different treatment of women because they have the capacity to bear children. So whether or not any individual becomes a mother, we are all subjected to something because we supposedly have that capacity. And so it seems to me that I'm troubled by the idea that freedom is just the freedom to become your singular self. But there are other kinds of freedom, such as the freedom to care for others, which is certainly the kind of ethics that my mother felt as a feminist. She, she thought that was what was at the heart of feminism, the, the ethics of care for each other. And she could understand that because she was a mother, but she wasn't, the implication wasn't that everybody should be a mother. But it troubles me that this, this idea that freedom is just the freedom to be me. What about the freedom? to care and as long as as a society we don't value that and somebody has to be the mothers <laughs> and unless we really value that that capacity as as something that can be actively chosen and a, and a great thing to choose and you can be a great human being in making that choice yeah. it seems to me we won't we don't have true freedom because we've only got somebody's idea of freedom which is a kind of singularised masculine freedom. I have to say that the, I was reading from two different pieces, and in the um, did some of the essays on hatred and forgiveness, where she's really focusing on singularity. It's in this piece where she's talking about this other kind of women's freedom of the through maternity. And there's no talk really there about the singularity. It's so it's a, a, she seems to be a kind of two minds about what women's freedom is. But certainly to your point about caring, that is vital, and so. Another way of looking at this is that whether or not we all choose to become mothers, we all had mothers. And we're all struggling with our relationship with our mother. And in this kind of reliance or reliance, what she's struggling with, the, with the, the pregnant mother is also struggling with kind of resolving what issues with her own mother that may be. So part of what happens with reliance in this kind of going is that the mother kind of revisits her own childhood. So in the, in the a really nice example of this, she offers is of the echolalias, you know, we talk like babies to our babies. We kind of go back and kind of this Proustian recovery of our own echolalia and pre-symbolic language to help the baby to, to speak with air, but then to step back, you know, it makes sense to me. So there's this kind of vacillation back and forth, this kind of caring, loving vacillation between with the speaking baby talk and then expecting the baby to make sense. And it's all in this very loving way, this kind of relationship to our own mothers. And if the and she has a brief example that I mentioned very briefly of that the opposite of reliance is possession. The mother that just kind of oh, the baby, I'm not gonna you're my baby, I'm never gonna I'm gonna possess you and have you. That sets up a really sick relationship. That made me think about Norman Bates, you know, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't I haven't seen the T V series about his going back in time, I just saw a clip and it made me think this mother probably just completely possessed him, so he had to kill her. And so that's the time, it's going to lead to death one way or the other. So this kind of maternal eroticism is not possessing the baby, but finding a way to to kind of use the unbinding of dominance. Anyway, it's, it's really fascinating and probably more uh, comfortable to think about the fact that we all have mothers and the crucial role that you're pointing out that mother has had for the whole human species. Okay. Our next speaker is Noreen McNamara from Queen's University, Belfast, and she's presenting Julia Kristeva and Bracket Edinger, Edinger, The Feminine and Ambiguity. Yeah, just move the mouse. Sorry. Move the mouse. Capital 
Okay, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about Kusteva and Ettinger, uh, their concept of the feminine and how that uh, helps us or uh, deal with ambiguity, feelings of ambiguity. Um, so this paper outlines how Julie Kusteva and Bretta Ettinger each conceptualize the feminine within the subjectivization process, drawing on their respective critiques of Lacanian theory. I show her that concepts of the feminine reveal a difference between them with regard to the significance of the gestation process. In presenting Kristeva and Ettinger's work side by side, I merely want to explore how they each theorize the feminine and highlight terms and concepts they provide, which give us a productive way to think how the feminine is structured within psychoanalytic discourse and what this means for how we think subjectivity. I concentrate mainly on Ettinger's theory, because um, you all know Kristeva <laughs> inside out, um, and I finish by discussing the ways in which each of their theories equip us to deal with and work with ambiguity. So, in her critique of Lacan, Kristeva argues that the real permeates the symbolic through the existence of semiotic signifying processes. The semiotic is that which disrupts the symbolic and affects change within it. According to Kristeva, Lacan replaces the subject and process, an inconstant movement between semiotic and symbolic, with the subject as lacking, whose desire is always indicative of an already lost and impossible real. Uh, she associates the semiotic with the feminine, and it's through the ordering of the semiotic core by the maternal entity that Kusteva highlights the role the maternal function plays in the child's acquisition of civilization. Kusteva argues that the semiotic allows us to speak of the real. Even though it is pre-symbolic, it is always there and operational. Although Kusteva modifies Lacan's theory in this way, the phallus is still the signifier of signifiers. She argues that in entering the symbolic through the castration process, life becomes meaningful. Bracha Ettinger argues that the symbolic, in the Lacanian sense, is too limited a concept. Within Lacan's symbolic, we enter through the castration complex and desire is structured around a lost object, which we can never recover. A return to the pre oedipal is impossible, and our only way of knowing is through language. Ettinger takes this, and rather than negate or dismiss Lacan's symbolic, she redefines it as the phallic stratum of subjectivity, within an enlarged symbolic. Within the phallic stratum, I exist and experience life through language, and I conceive of myself as separate and distinct from others. Alongside and beneath the phallic stratum, Ettinger articulates the matrixial stratum of subjectivities, whose processes and ways of experience the world are not structured around the castration complex. <coughs> she posits that there are multiple levels in this enlarged symbolic, and there are several pathways to access it. Uh, one means of accessing it is through the castration complex, but she ar also argues that we can access a different level of the symbolic through what she terms the maternal womb intrauterine complex. Ettinger argues that both of these archaic fantasy complexes appear in Freud's text on the uncanny, and both trigger a feeling of the uncanny. Yet although anxiety is the effect of both complexes on the adult subject, before their repression they were attached to entirely different affects. So she talks about, so while the castration fantasy is frightening at the point of the emergence of the original experience before its repression, the matrixial fantasy from matrix or womb is not frightening at the point of its original emergence, but becomes frightening when the experience is repressed. According to Ettinger, the intrauterine fantasy is not based on separation or rejection and should not be, quote, folded retroactively into the castration fantasy. The matrixial fantasy and complex leading to develop the matrixial stratum, which is entirely different to the phallic stratum. Ettinger developed matrixial theory through her engagement and experience with art working and psychoanalytic practices, and what happens in those spaces. She has been writing about it since the early 1990s. It's important to stress that her two key concepts, matrix and metamorphosis, are not, she says, inventions. Rather, they are elements of human experience which have always been taking place, but which, Ettinger argues, we have never been able to signify. So Kristeva suggests that pregnancy undermines the concept of the unified subject, and thus offers us a way to develop a new type of ethics which would recognize the otherness within. Ettinger posits that it actually serves as a model for another passage into the symbolic. It's important to stress, Ettinger does not negate the pre oedipal oedipal and post oedipal phallic stratum of subjectivity. One of our key points is that the matrixial stratum is not in opposition to the phallic stratum. They coexist and we regularly switch back and forth from the matrixial to the phallic within the same encounter. For Ettinger, the symbolic is composed of both the phallic and matrixial stratums and possibly other stratums which have yet to be theorized. So a general overview, she theorized the matrixial level as a pre-cognitive dimension, 
She argues that non-cognitive knowledge, and you have to accept the existence of such a thing as non-cognitive knowledge if you want to go with her, is transmitted along the matrixial web among partial subjects. She posits that self-fragilization, rather than openness or self-sacrifice, is required to access this level. At this level, she conceptualizes subjectivity as encounter, where you and I are not present, but rather partial subjectivities process matrixial effects, traumas, traces, fantasies, and pictograms. She cites intuition as a common example of something which originated at the matrixial level, which then rose to cognitive, and which I then know, I as an individuated subject know. So in further discussing the matrixial level, I would like to focus on eight and six <laughs> key concepts. So there's a small diagram. So if you look at the box over to the right, that's the symbolic, um, Lacan symbolic. And then the oval, I've taken this from Griselda Pollock largely, and sort of the dots, and that's my best attempt at a web <laughs> of partial subjectivities. And then obviously other levels, other signifiers, which she says maybe are yet to be theorized. So within the phallic stratum, the feminine is the opposite to the masculine. So you have feminine opposite P. Gustavo uh, associates the semiotic signifying processes with the feminine as that which disrupts and affects change within the symbolic, but it's still that box, Attinger says. Griselda Pollock, who has written extensively on matrixial theory, terms the masculine feminine opposition within the phallic stratum of subjectivity, masculine slash feminine P. And the feminine within the matrixial stratum of subjectivity, feminine M. So there you have in the black circle over. The feminine M does not refer to an essential nature of women or a biological reality. It's very important. It's not, <laughs> not for women or people who identify as women. In the matrixial sense, the feminine, and I quote Pollock here, is a, quote, dimension of psychic interconnecting by which all subjects, irrespective of later Oedipal gendering as boy or girl, are potentially subject subjectivized. Within the matrix, the feminine M has an active subjectivizing role to play. Ettinger argues that psychoanalytic theory has never developed, quote, inscriptions of, from, and in relationship to a female corporeal specificity, end quote, because of the potential psychotic effect it would have in the phallic paradigm. Matrixial incest, which is inevitable and produces life, cannot be prohibited, but it has been silenced in Western culture. Ettinger argues that only the desire to have children within heterosexual partnerships has been acknowledged. But matrixial desire, quote, that of linking with the unknown, banding with unknown others in the process of becoming and transforming oneself, end quote, has been marginalized, as it endangers our current conceptions of subjectivity, centered around individual, autonomous, self-determining subjects. Ettinger is careful not to posit the matrix as the only symbol for the feminine as a non-phallic sphere, but instead theorizes it as a basic starting point in an effort to describe differently from the feminine within the symbolic realm, this enlarged symbolic. Okay, so the second one is primal trans subjectivity. Ettinger posits that we develop this within the very, very late <laughs> prenatal stage of pregnancy. She and she does she's very careful to say this theory is not to be used in any way to oppose reproductive rights for women. Uh, she has a whole section on that, so anyway, let's put that out there. Uh, so within a very late stage of pregnancy, she posits that at this stage, the fetus has some awareness of I and unknown not eyes, and the mother has a similar awareness of I and not eyes. And there you have a quote of what the unknown not eye corresponds to. So one, the other, unknown to the I, unknown elements of the known I, so the unknown elements within myself, and to the unknown elements of the known other. So the non-I is unknown to the I on a cognitive level. But we should keep in mind that the non-I, quote, is known by non-cognitive processes. Metamorphosis, the process whereby I and unknown non-Is co-emerge within the matrixial sphere, is not symmetrical, identical, or mirroring relationship. It does not entail the domination or control of one over another. There is no one or other there. All involved are partial subjects co-merging and co-existence. So next one. Matrixial desire, matrixial eros. So whilst in no way idealizing this level of subjectivity, it can be experienced as extremely traumatic as well as healing, depending on the context. Ettinger does not does argue that matrixial desire, and I have quoted that already. So quote that of linking with the unknown and bounding with unknown others in the process of becoming and transforming, has been marginalized and yet is an integral part of the subjectivization process. 
The Matrix is not a variation of Gustavus' semiotic Cora. It is rather a, quote, concept for a transforming border space of encounter of the co-merging I and the neither fused nor rejected uncognized non-I. Um, so she said that matrixial desire is erotic. It is the work of Eros. However, this Eros is one of, quote, compassionate alliance with otherness on the borderline between non-life and life. Projection, substitution, and split do not work within the matrixial sphere. Knowledge is accessed through mechanisms which we commonly call inspiration, telepathy, intuition. So that's when we actually become aware of it. It's, it's, well, as it's happening, we're not, as individuated people, aware of it. So she uses, um, so we must be careful to distinguish between intersubjective relationships and matrixial border linking. The psychic mechanisms through which matrixial border linking operate are developed in the prenatal stage and are entirely different from those psychic mechanisms we use to understand postnatal attachment. So she has, I'm just going to draw your attention to three things which maybe help distinguish it from intersubjective uh, relations. So the first one is the asymmetrical nature of matrixial transference, which if you think about it, maybe it's best think about it in terms of an adult and child, and uh, an adult, clearly through length of time, will be connected to all sorts of matrixial webs and subjective clusters. A child won't be, they'll have a very limited uh, exposure to the world, and so the child connects through those and family members and things like that. So it's asymmetrical, it's, but at the same time it's at a level of partial subjectivity. Self-fragilization is required. So she theorizes it as kind of an originary, compassionate, affecting, um, but it gets shut down, obviously. Um, and as adults, if we want to access it again, and she would talk about accessing it through artworking or psychoanalytic encounter, provided there's a safe space there. So she talks, we must imagine the eye's compassion as a way of her pink feeling and uncognizing me knowing uh, through originary responsibility. So to access such a psychoethical basis on an adult we will have to return to the vulnerability by self fragilization And then she talks about principle of severality. So a matrixial encounter event is done through affect. Uh, so if I want to, uh, if I use uh, concepts, I can communicate with a large number of people, infinite maybe, through the web or whatever, but if it affects, it's always just a severality. It's never never a large number of people, okay, or subjectivities. I get confused with the language. <laughs> okay, um, how am I doing for time? Uh, eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So, um, so whereas Gustava argues that the feminine and maternal can threaten the subject's borders, and it absolutely can, um, Ettinger conceives of the borderline as transgressive and seeks to symbolize that which lies beyond the phallic paradigm. She argues that death and the foreclosed feminine do lie behind these borders. But the experience of co-emergence with the begetter archaic mother and the archaic drum and puissance associated with that are also present and accessible through metamorphic processes. She defines the archaic M slash other as a psychic space. And I think that's really important <laughs> to keep in mind uh, where traces from the becoming subject are inscribed, elaborated, and returned to becoming subject transformed. Everything that is transmitted is now cognitive knowledge. Within a matrixial encounter, once I know something of the unknown on I, I pass over to the phallic stratum of subjectivity. Carolyn Ducker points out that this idea of knowledge as bringing about the loss of something of a shared matrixial border space, quote, is a radical shift in traditional aspirations towards phallic mastery and control and in the privileged and exclusive role of language in achieving this domination." End quote. Ettinger's argument is that we engage in metamorphic processes all the time, and it is impossible to not share within the matrixial paradigm. This raises the question of how we attribute meaning to difference in jointness, which perceives and exists alongside our conception of ourselves as separate subjects. So the feminine and ambiguity. So Christina shows how the symbolic is already within the mother. She consistently reminds us of the blurring of distinction between self and other, how we affect and impinge upon one another, and the ongoing reality of the other within. She's interested in putting identity, quote, and process on trial. For Kristeva, the symbolic must be open to that which disrupts and affects change within it. Yet at the same time, it is necessary to take a position and adopt an identity within it. She posits her ethics as an ethics founded on the experience of motherhood. She focuses her attention on the division of the maternal body 
and the separation involved in the mother-child relationship. According to Kusteva, we need to accept that all identity is divisible and founded on separation. The cut is a reality, and we need to symbolize it, and thus keep ourselves from reenacting it on the material level. For her, an acceptance of the alterity within, a consciousness of the unconscious, and the undermining of any illusion of the unified subject, or an all-encompassing archaic mother, will lead to greater tolerance for difference in society. She warns against any desire to do away with uncanny strangeness. As such, the focus of her theory has been on learning how to accept the cut and the fundamental ambiguous nature of subjectivity. There is much to admire in her approach, particularly in her rejection of any archaic, all-encompassing mother, or dream of such. With that in mind, I think it's important to stress that the matrixia level is decidedly not a oneness, or all-encompassing, or an idealization of femininity. So, Edinger takes Lacan's woman, and argues that woman is an interlaced subjectivity, which is not limited to one body, and is a, quote, sexual difference based on webbing of links and not on essence or negation. So the matrixial stratum no way negates the phallic stratum, and indeed we are required to exist on the phallic stratum most of the time. It's necessary, as it's only on this level, the subjects of PPI take responsibility for their actions and practice freedom. Objection, projection, and assimilation play a large part in our collective psychic life. What Edinger's theory allows for um, our alternative psychic me mechanisms, which point to the necessarily interconnected nature of the subjectivization process, and could perhaps lead to a greater capacity to not only withstand ambiguity without engaging in objection, assimilation, or projection, but furthermore to work through affect, trauma, and resonance at the matrixia level. Having said that, my conclusion is a bit neat, <laughs> or too neat, given Christeva's recent writing on reliance. <laughs> which I only, um, I listened to Michelle's talk yesterday, I reminded myself or remembered that I should have read it a long time ago. Um, so when I first started this paper, I wanted to argue that Christeva's semiotic, at least some of its effects, are matrixial effects which have become in some way known and thus felt at the cognitive firework level of subjectivity. The matrix is not a version of the Cora. I think any examination of both concepts shows that. But I thought I could argue that some of the felt known effects of what happens at the matrixia level show up at the semiotic level. Uh, but then I was reading your book on Kristeva, and uh, she talks in an interview about how you shouldn't really try to translate one theory into another because you lose the particularity of each theory. So I was like, oops, <laughs> better not do that. And plus, I don't know if I could do it. But I think uh, in her essay on Reliance, um, she talks about how the semiotic is a uh, mode of signification per sense or something like that. I don't remember the exact quote. But I think she is trying maybe to talk about um, symbolization which is not cognitive. I'm not sure. Uh, I only, I've only kind of briefly gone through it. Uh, but I think there might, you could maybe argue that the semiotic is something that has come from the matrixial level, if you accept both of those. Um, so, um, will I leave it at that? Am I, am I out of time? Okay, well, just one more paragraph, is that okay? Uh, so, Ettinger is trying to theorize what are the psychic mechanisms which enable us all to link with one another in process or often, unfortunately, to just transmit uh, non cognized affect trauma and true sense. Uh, in terms of the value of theorizing such a level of subjectivity, I think it maybe goes back to what you were saying yesterday about what has been and what should be, or what is, but hasn't been theorized properly. Uh, whereas Gustava, I think, is excellent at sort of showing the difficulty of what we theorize, Dif difficulties for us all uh, in being in the symbolic. And you were talking about how some people are more comfortable in symbolic than others, <laughs> and the, the reasons for that. Um, and I think what Ettinger and Gustava in different ways, obviously, um, maybe with the concept of reliance and, and the matrix, are trying to enlarge our thinking on the symbolic such that more people are comfortable within it, or that we feel ourselves. That, yeah, like that's, that's just a thought. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah?
I think it is part of like the language, the, the baby moving into language and the way the mother goes back into the echo loud and gets helps back and forth. It's how to learn a language. Yeah, well, I only met very briefly last night when we were all But I think uh, she's still focusing on moving the child into symbolic. So that, that's my sense. But that she is, in, in what small bits she writes in the semiotic, thinking about something that is possibly uh, symbolized, symbol, it's, a, it's a mode of symbolization that is not cognitive. I, I, that was my sense. It, it is also, because it's, at one point she says in a very cryptic passage, that the um, maternal eroticism is at that gap early on between when the newborn is vacillating between kind of id and ego, mm -hmm. before ego, yeah. just the, you know, going to almost fall back into the mother's body and not yeah. separate. Yeah. So maternal eroticism it helps mm -hmm. the, the baby release from the mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of, and, and move into developing, becoming an object. Okay. So he's objected into becoming an object of, of care. Okay, yeah. So that's yeah. certainly pre. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, her, her energy still seems to be uh, moving, moving the child uh, to the symbolic. Whereas I think what Edinger is trying to theorize is this interlaced dimension of subjectivity between everybody. And the psychic mechanisms, she, she uses the model of the very, very, very late prenatal stages as a, as a way of kind of thinking through what psychic mechanisms enable that, this, this trans subjective realm uh, between us all. And is it because that we, she calls it like uh, the, the gestation process is initiation in jointness. I think you be really careful when you're talking about this in terms of reproductive rights and all of that, but it is, um, like you said, they're not the same, but I think Kristeva is maybe focusing more on, on what makes us, maybe, is she? Um, in, in this essay, really on it's like, um, well, it's, it begins early, begins with actual childbirth, yeah. And, um, and um, sorry, Michelle yesterday was talking about the film, which is very it's sort of like uh, there's the film of the really on to 11 minutes you can find online, and then there's the text. Mm -hmm. So the film is very evocative, it's kind of like the left hand side of Stava Mater. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the film begins with an actual image of a and then she says in here that one of the very first moments of the discharge, because mm -hmm. that's one of the one of the processes involved in us is the discharge of the abject of the thing, is actually the discharge birthing the baby. Yeah. So it, it's it's all along. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's quite different then. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> uh, sort of the, the, the moving away one from the other, and then uh, I think her in place of <coughs> trauma that circulates at a non-conscious level, and, and what do we do with that? So, so yeah, but I, like I think they're both maybe focusing on the need to uh, theorize being a corporeal, what comes from that more than that. No, they're they're coexisting. They are coexisting. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so she like in a conversation or in a, any sort of event, we can switch back and forth, and uh -huh. you you can often. I always think of them very late, late person's term. You come away from some people and feel awful, and for no apparent reason because you were talking about the weather. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but like that, um, that that has it has affected you at some level. You know, like words and, and even nonverbal stuff work perfectly fine but just something afterwards. Um, or you can feel great, alternatively. Or in art working, she talks about how you become very, very vulnerable. And her background is, is she's an Israeli um, artist, psychoanalyst, and she talks a lot about trauma and how that is transmitted. And how trauma, which is so much for one generation, just gets locked away and passed on to the next. But the next generation don't have memory. We've never talked about her. So it's just particles of the original trauma, but they don't have anything to, to hold. It's just, it's just
just an affect at that point. And so, and so how, do we, how do we deal with that? Just a footnote question. I was, I was wondering, <clears throat> I don't know her work either very well, and I'm wondering about the relationship between uh, matrix, the matrixial space, social sub-social social space, and what the philosopher, feminist philosopher Teresa Brennan called the transmission of affect, mm -hmm. and, and that being linked more politically and historically to the ways in which we think about the, the free, uh, fully formed cognitive subject. Um, so I'm just wondering if, you, if you've ever seen any kind of, there's so much work on affect right now, I'm just wondering how that matrixial piece fits with theories of affect. No, I, I, I don't. I don't have a, a massive knowledge <laughs> by any manner or means. And I, I, um, Teresa Brennan, I remember reading her years and years ago, and I haven't read her since. But I remember thinking maybe the difference is the partial subjectivity, the focus on being partial within Ettinger's work is not there in Brennan, as no. far as I remember. No. So I think I think that's that's the difference: the self-fragilization and the it's it's non-cognitive. But also, it's at a level, a, a trans subjective level. So you are never there. Um, it's it's just like she talks recently in the more recent paper of you are both a subject and a transject, which I think is confusing because people automatically think, well, there's me subject now, I'm transject, you know. <laughs> but that's not it at all. And it's hard for me to explain it. But I think I think that's the difference: that this self fragilization um, and uh, the fact that. We are not never there, and it is never cognitive. Um, and I, I don't know how to talk about that properly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I came to Edinger three years ago uh, as an artist, okay. as a practicing visual artist and a writing visual artist. And she also was very interested in it. And so I think there's different ways into Edinger's work. If you can read it, and it's, I find it very difficult to read. <laughs> is very difficult, it's a very new language, she's, and she just rolls on, you know, you rely on Pollock, but you're not really sure Pollock is getting it either at some level. So I sort of was interested that she, you know, Edinger does say, this theory came from my art practice. Mm -hmm. And she found then it was parallel and homologous with her psychoanalytic practice. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if we don't think in that angle, if we just try to come in one angle on, on Christian tricks up here, I think we're going to miss a lot. So I'm just suggesting uh, it also involves art practice oh, yeah. and an aesthetic into, mm -hmm. and I think with the psychoanalytic and our sort of more symbolic language, we might have a chance to <laughs> touch that. I'm sure she, is very, she is very explicit that the theory comes after the art, mm -hmm. and actually as someone who's taught a little bit of her work in the translation, they didn't have any I think looking at the artwork helps, yeah. because the visual helps you actually work through yeah. some of the very challenging yeah. examples. Our last panelist is Elizabeth Paquette from York University, and she's presenting a paper entitled A Dialogue Between Gustava and Viti, Transgressing the Category of Woman. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, the organizers uh, for this great conference and this panel of the team, uh, all of our thinkers. Um, and thank you all for coming uh, to your um, So the purpose of this paper is to discuss the structure of difference and sexual difference put forward by Monique Petit and Julia Kristeva. I will approach the conceptions of difference as it relates to their critiques of the category of women. For both author authors, an inherent problem of feminist movement is a perpetuation of this category. The emancipation of women cannot be achieved through the category of women. Rather, within their respective critiques, emancipation is possible by transgressing the dominant form of sexual difference. Physically, the concept through which they articulate these transgressions are the concept of fraternity for Christeva and the lesbian for BT. For many BT, any insatiation of the category of women is an instantiation of a sex individual. The marking of sex is allocated to women within what she calls the heterosexual contract. The concept of the lesbian, however, demarcates a space that is outside the mark of 
sexual difference and in an excess to the heterosexual contract itself. The concept of the lesbian is a tool through which we can come to think sexual difference in a new way. And ultimately, BT's project culminates in the plurality of sexes. Similarly, Julie Kuseva's account of maternity does not refer to the biological privilege of giving birth, and subsequently, it is not a conception that can be reduced to the category of women. Kuseva's account of the maternal can uh, be understood as an articulation of sexual difference through the relation between the subject and the other, embedded in the same body. By drawing a correlation between maternity and the semiotic, Kuseva will provide the foundation for an account of sexual difference which does not depend upon the category of women, but that is instead located in the interdependence between identity and difference. These concepts are key to understanding both critique and Christophe's feminist projects, projects that strive for the emancipation of women by identifying the relationship between identity and difference, and most importantly, through the construction of a new subject. Uh, so I'll start off with um, Mini critique. Mini critique locates the site of women's oppression in the dichotomous construction of sexual difference. One of the ways in which this is this problem is manifest as the naturalization of sexual difference insofar as the category of women is traditionally assumed to be uh, a natural group or a natural distinction. Critique states that, and I quote, race, exactly like sex, is taken as an immediate given, a sensible given, or physical feature belonging to a natural order, end quote. In other words, this naturalized, naturalized conception of sexual difference presupposes that the categories of men and women, or male and female, are necessary. This conception of sexual difference, which for BT is problematic, is read through a heterosexual lens and affirms an already there of the sexes, something which is supposed to have come before all thought and before all society. However, in opposition to this position, BT thinks that women is a social political category, an imaginary category based on an imaginary formation, which reinterprets physical features in themselves as neutral as any others, but marked by the social systems, through the network of relationships in which they are perceived. While for VT, bodies do in fact differ, she believes that the naturalization of sexual difference always belongs to an economic, political, and ideological order, rather than any distinction that relates to biology or nature. Subjects are not merely represented, rather they are constructed through these economic, political, and ideological orders. The central issue for fatigue is that women bearing the mark of sex are in a position which is contingent upon men as the bearers of a body transcendent universal personhood. The category of women is reduced to the particularity of being women and removed from the universal or general category. This occurs through what VT calls an operation of reduction by taking the part for the whole, a part through which the whole human has to pass as through a screen. So again, there's nothing natural or essential about this position, just that there's no reason where the category of men is, located, is allocated the position of universal. Rather, the category of women was produced by a structure of power that BT calls compulsory heterosexuality. This structure is dependent upon the relation between the category of men and women, wherein one determines the other. In other words, heterosexuality is a law which structures the manner in which women and men are produced. It structures the very appearing of bodies and thus mold bodies in a particular with this in mind, what can we say about the category of women as it appears in the work of Kriseva? I've come across a number of readings of Kriseva, and while I'm not through sorting through all the scholarship, I'd like to consider two somewhat opposing readings of the category of women in Kriseva's system, the readings of Elizabeth Ross and Kelly Oliver. I will begin with the work of Ross. So according to Gross, is, er, Gross uh, it is not the case uh, that women do not exist in the symbolic order. However, it is the manner in which they appear that is our concern. In other words, it is not the case that women cannot speak or gain a stable position <coughs> from which to speak in symbolic. But if they do, it is from a male position. Only men are granted a position from which to speak. They are granted a stable position, and thus, in order to speak, one must take up this position. More importantly, however, is the fact that women as women cannot speak in and through the symbolic order. For Garas, this has repercussions on our ability to conceive of anything like women's literature, as this literature would itself exist outside of language, and would lend itself to, to lend itself to the side of a particular position, something like just women being just women's writing, rather than something that could be granted universal 
exhibition, something like writing in general. So the thrust of Grass's comments as I've outlined them here is to suggest that Kristeva is, as a result, incapable of a feminist project. It is to problematize the ability for women to become emancipated, except for the subposition that's allocated to men. However, I do not believe that what Grass says about the category of women is in opposition to a feminist project. Rather, what Grass is indicating here is that for Kristeva, like for BT, the construction of something like women's literature perpetuates the category of women, sex, whereby women continue to be marked as sex, or as a particular position in opposition to the universal category. So given a dominant system of representation, neither Chris David nor BT think that particular and thus a subordinate position can achieve emancipation by further entrenching its particularity. So given this, what do we do? First, neither Chris David nor BT believe that we can do away with a symbolic order itself. However, both desire to find a way to shift it such that it is no longer oppressive to women. What is required is a kind of transgression wherein there is shifting of boundaries that not only attends to the order through which the categories are constructed, but furthermore, it maintains that this transgression must come about from within the order itself. This transgression is not, not a radical break with symbolic order, nor does it call for its dissolution. If we agree with Gras that within the service system, women are not allocated a position from which emancipation is possible, I believe that like BT, the tool that is necessary in order to transgress the oppressive structure of a symbolic order is not the category of woman itself, but rather uh, Kristeva's maternity, or something like BT's lesbian. So let's begin with uh, BT's concept of the lesbian. So first, in the lesbian body, BT performs the act of deconstructing the body in order to demonstrate a new way in which the sex body can be given meaning. The task at hand is to show that the body can be reconstructed in more ways than the anatomical account, uh, something like what we find in the work of Lisa Rigori. Fatigue is attempting to reconstruct the boundaries between bodies and discourses by literally remapping the sex body, a remapping which occurs between two women. The purpose of this act, however, is to provide an intersubjective perspective that does not adhere to the naturalized categories of men and women, or one that is based upon anatomical differences. So in line with the deconstruction of the body, Petit develops the concept of the lesbian. She utilizes the concept because the lesbian lies conceptually in excess to the heterosexual contract. In other words, the lesbian cannot be accounted for within the heterosexual contract. Petit is not attempting to instantiate a third gender that exists prior to social relationships. In other words, the concept of the lesbian is not based upon biological or, or an anatomical body lying behind or prior to the social constructions of sexual difference nor is a lesbian founded in sexual practices. In other words, a lesbian is not a woman who loves a woman. The lesbian subject does not conform to these gender categories, nor does it refer to any natural manifestation of sex bodies. Rather, it is a site from which to problematize and to reject the heterosexual contract. It is purely symbolic for BT. It is an empty signifier to the extent that it performs the function of creating an alternative space from which we can conceive of sexual difference by demonstrating that there is a plurality of ways in which sexual difference or the sex body can be thought. What we must keep in mind, however, is that the concept of the lesbian does not exist outside language. And in fact, BT tells us that we cannot escape language. Rather, its purpose is to bring about a new discourse, and thus a new way in which to conceive of sexual difference. So again, this is like a, this is a shifting of boundaries from the creation of a new language. So in addition to this point, BT uses various methods in her fiction to interrupt the language of the subject. The personal pronoun I, or je in French, is interrupted with a slash in the middle of the word. The word as such becomes difficult to read. However, the symbolic function of the slash indicates that the language that BT is using is not her own. It is a language that is by and for the privileged position of the white male. So for BT, just to pick up the language but recognize the inherent structure of it, be extremely problematic. The point is that the female subject cannot simply exist in or through the language in which she writes, but that she must interrupt it in order to be a subject within this language. Petit's project depends on a notion of creativity and freedom. With BT, we are free only insofar as we are able to create new meaning. 
such as, the delineation, such as delineating new forms of the sex body. But furthermore, new meaning is always contingent. It has yet become necessary and universal, or part of the symbolic order. However, BT is not for a particular meaning that becomes sedimented in a new origin. Rather, the purpose of the creation of new meaning is that it alters the symbolic order. Thus, the concept of the lesbian as both the potential site for the remapping of the sex bodies and as the site of the interruption of language is the performance of the creation of the new meaning. The risk of the transgression of the symbolic order becomes possible. So like BT's construction of the lesbian, Christopher's concept of maternity is pivotal for the establishment of a feminist project. According to Grass, however, I quote, maternity affects a subject annihilation, the fading of sexual identity, end quote. This critique can be understood as mounted against both the seven BT, and it holds that the concept of maternity and the lesbian are processes without a subject. Secondly, Elizabeth Frost says the following about Kristeva. Quote, Kristeva, Kristeva's resistance to attributing any female identity to maternity becomes ludicrous in her view of willingness to describe maternity in biological and physiological terms. Reluctant to ascribe any physical identity to the female body, on the grounds of essentialism, she happily attributes maternity to an equally essentialist and biologistic explanation. Okay, uh, similarly, one must ask what, what we are to do with the concept of the lesbian. Who can take up this position? And for whom is this position available? The point is that both concepts draw our attention to the female identity. That, con that these concepts do not themselves take up. But what Grass has not attributed to the maternal body, and likewise what is present in BT's concept of the lesbian, is a kind of operation that these concepts make possible. They provide the condition for the dissolution of sex identities and the dissolution of the category of women by establishing a new framework through which we can think of the sexual difference itself. Um, so let's turn to the concept of maternity in Christeva. So first and foremost, we should think of the way in which the maternal body encompasses another, another that is not altogether other, but is not altogether her own. This concept thus breaks down any clear boundaries between subject and other, and this calls on us to put into question our notion of difference. Thus, like BT, there is no necessary delineation between the self and the other, where difference itself, although important, is contingent upon the structure through which it is read. While it is the case that the maternal body is not a unified subject, to the extent that the subject is not static, it does provide the space for the articulation of difference within each subject, or difference within identity. Furthermore, the maternal body provides the foundation for a new subject body. What the maternal makes possible is a mode of disentangling woman's selfish definition from the phallus through, and I quote, experiences of heterogeneity, not between one body and another, but between oneself and one's body, and one's body and oneself, sorry, or one's language. So I'll read that again. <clears throat> is a mode of disentangling woman's self-definition from the phallus through experiences of heterogeneity, not between one body and other, but between oneself and one's body, or oneself and one's language. End quote. While BT performs a remapping of the body as a work that is between two women, I believe that a similar process is occurring here. What is at stake is a conception of difference that is first not limited to the anatomical distinction of sexual difference of men and women. Uh, in other words, the difference is, is not located between two bodies. But rather, here, sexual difference is located between oneself and one's language, uh, and that sexual difference is already inherent to each one of us. It is with this in mind that Kristeva draws a correlation between the semiotic and maternity. Even Grass tells us that, and I quote, maternity is the source of the semiotic and the precondition of the symbolic, end quote. It is a condition for the possibility of the symbolic and lays the foundation for identity itself. But at the same time, it is an excess to the symbolic and threatens it with overflowing it. It is neither outside the symbolic nor is it an opposition to it. I think this last point is important because for both Bt and Kristeva, the transgression of a category of woman is only possible from within the symbolic order itself. As such, the semiotic and the maternal make possible the creation of a new subject and new identity. 
Perhaps the question still remains, does transgression of the symbolic order or of a patriarchal nature require a unified subject, a privileged position which is granted to, to men or to one who assumes the position of men, as is noted by Grass? My answer to this question is that it does not. This effort provides us with an account wherein we construct, in, construct a new subject that is not unified, while simultaneously accounting for the manner in which the symbolic system is still necessary for the emancipation of women. So ultimately, the point is that is sorry, the point is that while the maternal body and the living body bring to mind notions of the female body, we must remember that neither one refers to refers to this body. They are what make possible the conditions through which we conceive of a new construction of the subject, and through which we can delineate new conception of body as sex. Furthermore, while the conception of maternity might not have the agency of a unified subject, this does not mean that the maternity that maternity is subjectless. Rather, it is the site of subject formation. Furthermore, within Christopher's project, the crisper sexual difference is located internal to every subject rather than existing between individual subjects, and results in the overcoming of binary codings of male and female and the dissolution of male and female identities. This effort does not call for the dissemination of all identity, because we can never get outside the symbolic order. Rather, she calls for the dissolution of the category of women, because this category fails to account for all women, and furthermore, it fails to transgress the oppressive structure of the symbolic. So just briefly in summation, uh, for both Boutique and Kuseva, what is necessary is not the establishment of a new category, rather it is a dissolution of the categories through which the oppressive structure operates. I believe both the maternal body and the lesbian body perform similar operations, and both objects delineate, delineate a space in which a new subject can come about, a site of subject formation itself, and furthermore the creation of new meaning in language as well. What becomes possible in their respective theories is a feminist project, the yeah, one which is no longer that no longer depends on the category of women. Explain when you say, and I might have misunderstood because I don't know if this work hardly at all. But can you explain when you say that? I think you said that she she doesn't want to break down the symbolic. Yeah. Um, so uh, fatigue, and so one way I'm reading this stuff as well is that um, the symbolic itself is something you can't get away from. Well, um, well, 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 my question is, what is 
what is she meaning by that term symbolic in that case? So, um, uh, systems of representation? A any system, because, uh, for instance, the Lacanian symbolic mm -hmm. is, is predicated on this notion that there is uh, a master signifier, the phallus, and, the, and, the, and it's sexual difference is re the relationship to the phallus. I'm not agreeing with her, I'm just saying that's, mm -hmm. so she's not talking about that notion of the symbolic, she's so talking about something else. She, uh, she doesn't go into great detail about this, and so I think that she is, in a certain sense, uh, moving from that kind of, but she's also trying to take up on materialist project. So she doesn't actually, she never talks about the symbolic, she never talks about the semiotic or any of those terms really. Um, so she's looking at the, um, the structure through which um, like bodies um, appear in a certain way. So the way in which like woman is, is represented as a category um, within um, the power structure or the ideological order that, um, that, I mean she doesn't say whether it's national or whether it's like where, where those, those situations um, happen. But it is about like um, um, attending to the way that there's a certain power structure that reveals the way that our bodies um, appear in the world. So whether or not I, I'm not entirely sure how um, how much she sticks to the uh, Lacanian concept of symbolic order. Um, I don't think that she sticks to it very much. But um, I think that for her there are um, the point is to continually undermine the way in which um, the way in which bodies in particular appear, essentially. And that there can always be more ways in which um, the sex body can appear. At which point would that be successful? What do you mean? This subversion. Um, so I'm not sure that you can I don't I don't think that there's a perfect world for me to get on that you would actually ever um, uh, attain that perfection. Um, I think that's so I'm like I'm, I'm going off the map a little bit but I don't think that um, um, I don't think the symbolic order allows for um, a perfect world where the bodies can. So it's it, it's a, it's what's sort of a continually undermining whatever the order is. But how would then how would mm -hmm. one then know that one is undermining something mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. there's no telos in a way? Well, it's always in in relation to the whatever the. But it's undermining simply because it is different. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so she does have a concept of freedom, but I'm not sure how much she goes into um, the way in which the undermining has to relate to freedom. And I'm not sure that she's even thought that far ahead, because she's doing many different contexts. So um, she's like she may even stop there. Um, she just stops the head. So what's that done? With? I don't think she would say that, um, but she doesn't. She doesn't really give a whole lot of other. Well, there seems a tension in in Vijay Gunnar as a rivalist of a more radical constructivist, and I'm hearing the other two family members presenting some of a little more biological essential with the constructivist. Um, do you have any sense of? I'm listening to each other with the review. you. Um, how you make sense of maybe any of these coming together. So I've just been picking it as an interesting tension for me. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I mean, I, uh, I was hesitant to say that the, the maternal body was um, biological, I guess, in that sense. And that's sort of um, the kind of reading that I was getting at. Um, I think it's, I think like the lesbian, um, like what PT is doing, that it's a useful tool for thinking about the way in which bodies can be constructed in different ways. Um, and I think that's, um, I think that um, that's a, a way of getting into what this is. But I can ask you very much. Can I jump in? Because yeah. I, um, I uh, your reading of Elizabeth Gross's reading of Esteva is very foreign to me. It's been 20 years since I read Gross, um, Christeva, but um, in reading Christeva, I don't see Christeva as thinking that the symbolic order addresses the victim. Okay. Uh, because in her work on, like, her work as an analyst is to help people 
I mean, if we if we lose the symbolic, we become psychotic, mm -hmm. right? And narcissistic. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the work of an analyst is to help someone move into the symbolic. It's it's not it's not this equivalent to the way you're describing the big project. I mean, we don't want the symbolic to to crush out any semiotic dimensions of simplification. So there's always a revolt is partly about that. But I so I just. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, absolutely. Oh. So if I can just make a comment. So I didn't mean to equate the small border with the impression of woman. Um, and, um, and I maybe gestured toward that, but didn't say it specifically. Um, uh, I think that because I was uh, definitely think that like, we need the small border, is that there will be a certain sort of uh, structure of the order that can um, become the application. And that's how the kind of thing happens. You know, so maybe that's even more of a piece of that. So, I mean, you can just think of either that we need this a lot of time. We need to see the representations in order to um, uh, interact with each other and like, to have a world where we can function. Um, but that, that um, having static identities is going to be helpful. I identities can be um, different. Absolutely. So, um, uh, a lot of people read BT as saying that um, that she thinks everyone should be a woman, um, and that's not that's not what she's saying. And so, um, at various points in time, she said that the, the lesbian is an empty concept, and so it doesn't it doesn't mean the way that we the way we we talk about it now. Um, and so, these distinctions within the category of lesbian it, um, it doesn't quite apply because it's not supposed to mean anything other than the subversion of the heterosexual. Um, and so it's just it's the tool. It's not it's not quite um, it's not quite a person or a subject or any of those things the way that I'm reading BT. Um, but it's it's a kind of operation where we can um, we can talk about sex bodies um, by no longer denoting them as like penis, no penis, um, and that we can we can start to draw different different categories around the bodies essentially. Um, and so I don't I um, I don't think that she falls into that that problem. But that's a, that's a, certainly a problem. I mean, to get this is my belief. Yeah, yeah. No, I just, I, I, this is really complicated, and I wanted to say that one of the things that is emerging here for me, at least, is this, I think, right now debate between where we're going to go, caught between a kind of Halberstamian, Butlerian critique of Vitique, et cetera, or even early Eve Sedgwick's critique, where this sort of constructivism gone wild versus versus this sort of new encounter that you were describing between neuropsych and and um, and psychoanalysis where there's a lot of for me a lot of danger and a lot of opportunity um, 
a danger in the sense of, of accountability and blame. Um, for example, some of the work that's being done on uh, environmental factors in um, maternal uh, outcome, et cetera. Well, who, you know, do we politicize to change the environment or do we blame the, the mother, et cetera? Um, so it seems to me that today the, it's this encounter between um, the sort of constructivist, uh, uh, I call it a tangent, but this sort of move philosophically away from, you know, poor Monique died. I mean, she didn't get to write anymore. And I think that, that that's important because, because the, the category of lesbian at the time she was writing was like the cutting edge. That was the only place to go. And then, you know, people have gone other places since. But where that, that has always felt very freeing for all kinds of bodies, all kinds of, of, uh, of libidinal arrangements. And now neuropsych is sort of coming back and saying, yes, but. And it, I, I'm just, I'm very interested in also in, in the ways in which these other voices from the arts are coming in and saying, well, you know, we don't have to be, you know, essentialist about it, but there is something, whether we call it affect or we call it matrix or whatever we call it. So anyway, I just think you've all raised a lot of, you know, really perplexing and complicated questions that deserve a lot of attention. I'm really interested in the, in the neuropsych, psychoanalytic conversation and Chris Davis' place in that. There's lots of danger, lots of opportunity. We'll have to stop here and continue the conversation over lunch. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists.